There was an old story about a pastor who was having problems and decided to leave the ministry, but he ran into trouble finding another job. Now, finally, in desperation, he took a job at the local zoo. You see, the gorilla had died. The gorilla had died, and since it had been the children's absolute favorite animal, the zoo officials decided to put someone in a gorilla costume until a real replacement could be found. And to the minister's surprise, he loved the job. He really, really loved it. He got lots of attention. He could eat all he wanted. There was no stress, no deadlines, no complaints or committees. And he could take a nap anytime he wanted to. Well, one day he was feeling particularly frisky, so he began swinging on the trapeze. Higher and higher he went. But suddenly he lost his grip, and he flipped a couple of times and landed in the Knicks cage. Stunned and amazed, dazed, he looked up and saw a ferocious lion. And in his panic, he forgot he was supposed to be a gorilla, and he yelled, help, help, help. And the ferocious lion turned in his direction and said, oh, shut up, man, I'm a minister too. <laughs> <laughs> Lori loves that one. She loves that one. <laughs> Love you, sweetheart. I, like I got to tell you real quick, this is, this is Lori in, in my life sometimes. It's Valentine's Day, right? It's Valentine's Day, and Lori had worked night shift, and I'm getting ready to leave in the morning, and she was already in bed. Well, as I'm getting ready to leave the house, we pass each other in the hallway, and uh, I say, Happy Valentine's Day, honey. And she says, you too. <laughs> goes in the restroom, comes out, goes back to bed. That's how we roll. That's how we roll in and a you too. <laughs> Romance. Well, there's a fascinating story, fascinating story about a, about a businessman named John Henry Patterson who back in 1884 founded the National Cash Register Company. And I know that many of you worked for, or you know people who did work, who did work for NCR. Almost immediately, as many of you I'm sure know, almost immediately the company was profitable. Patterson made it successful because Patterson paid attention to the details. He paid attention to the details and kept an eye on each department in the company. Well, at one point, it became very apparent that the factory was having a high, high number of burglaries. And Patterson was convinced that the security staff was not doing their job. So, one night, what Patterson does is he goes and he puts on a phosphorescent suit a suit that glowed in the dark. And he rode up to the plant on a white horse. He jimmied open the door to the tool room, helped himself to several spare parts, and rode off without being challenged a single time. Next morning, he replaced the entire security staff. Now, how could those, how could it be that those in charge of security would not see a would-be burglar wearing a suit that glowed in the dark and riding on a white horse. Somebody was not doing their job. Well, today we celebrate, as Renee read for us beautifully earlier, we celebrate Transfiguration Sunday. Transfiguration Sunday to remember when Jesus invited his closest disciples Peter, James, and John, to go with him up on a high mountain. And there, Matthew tells us, Christ was transfigured before them. He writes about the master. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. That reminds me, reminds me very much of John Henry Patterson's phosphorescent suit. But this 
was real, it was authentic. It's not the end of the story, that's for sure. And just then the disciples, we read, saw two other individuals on that high mountain conversing with their master, Moses and Elijah. Now make no mistake about it, this was a once in a lifetime experience. Peter, who always seemed to need to make a comment, said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But we read that while Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came up to them, and he touched them, and he said, Get up. Do not be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one, no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Well, of course, Peter later would tell about this experience. How could he possibly keep it to himself forever? Peter wrote two epistles. He wrote two epistles, which are both included, of course, in the New Testament. In the second one he wrote, for we did, and he's talking about this experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter writes, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories. In other words, we didn't make it up. We did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we are eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. This is significant. This is significant, friends, that Jesus' baptism, it's difficult to know. It's really hard to know if anyone beside Jesus heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, with him I am well pleased. This time, however, this time there can be no doubt. Peter heard the voice. James heard the voice. John heard the voice. It was the voice of God declaring, this is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Please. They saw Christ transfigured. They beheld Moses and Elijah, who, friends, they'd been physically dead for hundreds of years, standing there with him, and they heard the voice of the Almighty. And this all happened right in front of their very eyes. There could no longer be any doubt that this man whom they followed was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And yet, yet... Just a short, short time later, Peter would be denying that he even knew Jesus. And James and John would be hiding behind locked doors. As if they had no knowledge of Christ's power and his purpose. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? Well, we can't explain it except to say... <laughs> They were very much like us. They had faith like a yo-yo, sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes almost to the ground. It was only about a week, only about a week before the transfiguration that Jesus had asked his apostles just about seven days before he asked this question, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And who was it that answered him? Simon Peter. Simon Peter, of course, he said, you are the Messiah, 
the son of the living God. And Jesus praised him, saying, and you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And then Jesus, of course, began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must suffer many, many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, that he must be killed, and that on the third day he must be raised to life. How does Simon Peter respond to this? He takes Jesus aside. He takes the master aside and then he begins to rebuke him. Never, Lord. Never, never, he said. This shall never happen to you. Now, can you imagine that? He's just affirmed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and then he turns right around in the same conversation and tries to tell him how to go about his business. When Jesus turns to Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. One moment he's the rock, the next Peter is Satan. Now a week later, seven days later, he's up on a mountain offering to build booths for Christ, Moses, and Elijah. But Very soon, he'll be standing in the courtyard where someone will ask him, aren't you one of his disciples? And he will declare with an oath, I am not. Now, friends, Simon Peter is us. We're just as wishy-washy in our faith. One moment we feel so close to God so close that we're willing to give him all that we are, all that we ever hope to be. In the very next moment, in a time of testing, we deny that we ever knew him. How do you explain that? There's only one way. The disciples were human, just like you and me. They were full of good intentions, poor in execution. This is one reason we're so grateful for God's grace, friends. Everyone who is serious about his or her faith, fact is, struggles. Struggles at times in his or her pilgrimage. The only people who do not struggle are those for whom faith, faith is but a surface phenomenon to which they're hardly committed at all. One of my favorite pieces of humor is that one about the man who woke up and reported the had a, had a terrible, terrible nightmare. He dreamed he was right behind. He's standing right behind Mother Teresa going into heaven, and he heard St. Peter say, I'm sorry, Teresa, it wasn't enough. <laughs> now, friends, friends, if heaven were based on merit, On merit, Mother Teresa would be omitted, the Apostle Paul would be omitted, the Apostle Peter would be omitted. Heaven would be a mighty lonely place. As one fellow said, if heaven's based on merit, the only people who would be there are Jesus and my wife's first husband. I mean, everyone, everyone who's ever done their best, done their best to follow Jesus has stumbled at one time or another. That's because we walk by faith. We walk by faith and not absolute knowledge. Mother Teresa struggled with her faith, friends. She struggled with her faith during most of her great, great ministry. Mother Teresa wrote to a friend and priest, and I want to quote it, She wrote, Jesus has a very special love for you. As for me, the silence and the emptiness are so great that I look and do not see, listen and do not hear. And Mother Teresa gave herself completely. Gave herself completely, as anyone on this earth is likely to give himself or herself, but she still struggled, like Peter. 
just like Peter, just like James, just like John, struggled, even after the transfiguration, in which they, they heard the very voice of God. They were present. They saw it. And hundreds, if not thousands, of miracles in Jesus' physical presence. That's life. And in a very real sense, that's faith. For now we see through a glass darkly. Darkly, wrote St. Paul in 1 Corinthians, but then we'll see face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. A successful businessman once traveled to India to, to spend a month working in one of Mother Teresa's shelters. He longed to meet her, but Mother Teresa was traveling, and it was not until the day before his departure that she had time to talk to him. When he was finally in her presence, much to his surprise, he burst into tears. He just burst into tears all the times when he'd been self-centered, all the times he'd been busy, or all the times that he'd been focused on his own gain flashed before his eyes, and he felt this enormous sadness that he had missed so many opportunities, missed so many opportunities in his life to give himself and his resources. Without a word, Mother Teresa walked over to where he was seated, put her hands on his shoulders, and looked deeply into his eyes, and she said, Don't you know? Don't you know that God knows you're doing the best that you can? God knows. God knows our hearts. God loves us with an everlasting love. And out of that love, God has given us a gift, a gift, unmerited gift, the free gift of grace. And gratitude, it's very important that we keep that faith alive. We are all, every one of us in this room, realize it or not, doesn't matter, we're all in constant danger. Constant danger of backsliding, of slipping away from God, if Peter, James, and John were in danger after their experiences with Christ, if Mother Teresa was in danger even after all her good works, then how much more danger are you and I in of allowing our hearts to grow cold and our lives to become indifferent to Christ's claims? That's the importance. That's the importance of being in worship each and every week. That's the importance of sharing in small groups with other believers. That's the importance of immersing ourselves in the scriptures to guard against entropy of the soul. The natural tendency when we're away from the presence of God to allow the wonder of faith, no matter how real in our lives, slip away. That's what the transfiguration is all about. In our own way, each of us has been to the mountaintop at some time in our lives. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But we're sinners. We love him. But in the time of testing, We've each denied him. We're grateful to be recipients. Grateful to be recipients of his grace. And we commit ourselves again this day to seek and all we do to be close to him. Close to him. Close to him. From this day forward. Let's bow our heads. Almighty God, before the passion of your Son, you revealed his glory upon the holy mountain. Grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, 
may be strengthened to bear our cross. Indeed, O Lord, give us the vision to see beyond the turmoil of our world and to behold him in all his glory. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh God, at the holy mountain we open our eyes and we see Jesus, the months of ministry transfigured to a beam of light, the light of the world, your light. May your light always shine upon us. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh God, we open our eyes and we see Moses and Elijah with Jesus, your word, restoring us, showing us the way, telling a story, your story, his story, our story. May your word always speak to us. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh God, we open our eyes and we see mist, the cloud of your presence, which assures us of all we do not know and that we do not need to fear. Teach us to trust. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh God, we open our eyes and we see Peter's constructions, his best plans, our best plans, our missing the point, our missing the way. Forgive us our foolishness and our sin. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh God, we open our eyes and we see Jesus, not casting us off, but leading us down, leading us out to ministry, to people. Help us to share his love, your love. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh God, hear our prayers, not just for ourselves, but our prayers for one another at this time. Our prayer that they who are lost might be found, that they who are lame might walk, they who are sick may be healed, they who are enslaved may be set free, they that mourn may be comforted. We pray, O God, for, Lord, hear our prayer.
O oh God, at your holy mountain, we open our ears and we hear your voice saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. We give you thanks and we pray in his name that we might always do your will and hearken to his voice, both on the mountains and in the valleys of life. And now we'll join together confidence of the children of God saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. 